This is Captain's Log with your host, Captain Mark Gray. Welcome aboard. My Sea Tales guest is Mr. Jerry Gaylord. Welcome aboard, sir. Or rather, you should be welcoming me aboard. This is your yacht, your boat. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about your boating history? Well, uh, I started boating in 1964 when we purchased our first boat. Uh, it was a sailboat. I've gradually gone up to power, but we had that almost 10 years to the day. Sold it, purchased our first power boat, which was a 31-foot uh, sport fisher. Had that approximately four years, at which time we sold it and purchased this boat right here. And this was the first new boat I've had. And it'll be, it was just nine years old uh, last 4th of July. So overall, I've been boating for about 24 years. And what type of boat is this? This uh, is a trawler. It's an American-built boat made down in Costa Mesa, 38-foot, uh, powered by twin diesel engines. Uh, very comfortable and seaworthy boat. We found it uh, very comfortable for what we do, which is primarily cruising and uh, di scuba diving, fishing, and just generally relaxing and enjoying life. Well, for nine years old, it does look in mint shape, but I do understand you have a sea tale for us, a true story with a safety message. And could you tell us about that, sir? Yes, I do. Uh, I recently, well, within the last four or five years, have been certified for scuba diving. Uh, after that, my daughter, uh, my son is, is certified, and my daughter also decided that she would like to get into scuba diving. Uh, for those of who are familiar with any diving activities, uh, there is a lot of training one goes through, uh, a lot of safety items. Uh, you spend a lot of work in the pool and then go out in open water dives where they teach you buddy breathing with when you're with your buddy if they should run out of air. Also things making free ascents from very deep water. My daughter, who for a girl is rather macho, when she started diving, she used to dive with me all the time, and she was convinced that, gee, Dad always uses air much faster than I do. So all of the training she got, she more or less uh, got a little complacent and always gauged her bottom time based on whether or not I had air without paying any attention to her own pressure regulator and also uh, how much air she had left in the tanks. Uh, during the lobster season last year, uh, I took her on her second dive uh, for a lobster, and we were diving in approximately 90 feet of water and as usual she was always using uh, dad as the gauge because if dad has air I've got air because he always runs out of air first well when I start diving deep I used a different tank a uh, tank that is good has a larger volume and higher pressure which she was unaware of so that I could get my bottom time up to stay down there for lobster well we were working the bottom and there was a very strong current running and again, her second dive, uh, she was expending air a lot faster than she thought. I went off uh, looking in some holes and caves for lobster and turned back to check on my daughter and she gave me the sign that she, uh, it indicated she was getting low on air. When in reality, uh, she was telling me she was out of air. So, so the wrong sign came across. The wrong there. sign came across. Uh -huh. uh, she should have uh, never gotten as low as she did on air. But once I realized that she was in a problem, I swam back over to her and she grabbed my regulator to start breathing air. Uh, and I was able to get air to her, but in making the ascent, she did uh, become unconscious. Uh, one of the beauties of diving in this type of situation is one of the things they always tell you is never ever hold your breath. Well, with an unconscious person, uh, automatically you start exhaling because as you as ascend from deep water high pressure the air in your lungs begin to expand so you're always pushing air out of your lungs well we were able I was able to get her to the surface and revive her uh, after we got everyone on board and she got through the initial shock it became very evident to me that the courses you take and the information that is taught when you start diving, and particularly in the type of diving we do on aboard our boat, take a few people out, uh, it's easy to become complacent. It's very comfortable down there, it's interesting, you see a lot of different uh, sea, marine life, uh, some of the diving off of California here in the Channel Islands, some of the most beautiful spots in the world. You become very complacent, and my daughter fell into that bad habit of not checking your equipment, but it comes across to you real fast that there's going to be a time there's an emergency. 
And that one emergency there was very fortunate for me because immediately to fall back to buddy breathing and what you should do when there is an emergency, I, I'm really glad I had the course and was able to help her because it, uh, what we did was avoid, I think, a very serious accident. Uh, and I think one of the things that uh, at least I've got from my daughter too is when we do go diving now, just for a pleasure dive, we'll go through some of the routines for uh, making free ascents from deep water, buddy breathing, so that if this happens again with her or myself or someone else, a friend, that we won't have to stop and think what to do or how to do it, but it'll be just become automatic to you. Uh, I think uh, in diving, scuba diving on some of the commercial boats, when they take a lot of people out who don't have a boat, uh, the routines they go through, they have a dive master. People there are always attuned to the emergencies that can happen. You have a lot of people, a lot of friends around, always keeping you on your toes. But in your private vessel with a few friends, it's easy to become complacent. To All of a sudden it becomes uh, second nature to you. So you kind of grab your gear and you go diving this weekend, next weekend. And uh, it's perhaps in the case of your daughter, she even forgot the right sign for, hey, Dad, I'm out of air. Yeah, she did. And though. so you could stroll over to her thinking, well, she's low in air. And uh, so it is important to keep reviewing these things. Yes, it is. It's very important because uh, it, it just that uh, you may dive in the one season and be off for a while, and you need to hone those skills again. And and also to go through the signs that one needs to make down there to, to, to know what's happening. Always keep uh, your buddy in sight because you can get engrossed in things that you're doing either after game or just uh, seeing the sights that uh, are down there. So it's not just merely check your equipment, make sure everything's operational, but go over the signs and, and rehearse what you'll do if this comes up or if that comes up. And you know, as it applies to boating, um, I believe the same could be said about a lot of boaters. They go out weekend after weekend, have an enjoyable time, nothing, no bad weather, no engine problems for two or three months or however long. And then all of a sudden when something hits, they go, now, what was that? You know, because they hadn't reviewed it. So uh, I believe that's very important. Uh, do you have any finishing statements? We have about one minute left. Okay, well, uh, for, for the diving, uh, this is a... a uh sport that's new to me. I think for people who are, are thinking about boating, it's just one more aspect of, of uh, life uh, on the ocean. There's a lot to do, but while it, uh, some people tend to think it's a dangerous sport, I think it's no more dangerous than anything else. Uh, some of the sea life you see, uh, you hear a lot of uh, talk about sharks and shark attacks for divers and that. Uh, we've always had one rule of thumb that I would pass on everyone else that if you are diving and you're diving anywhere there where there's a lot of seals around, you got to stop and think you're diving in that shark's kitchen. Mm -hmm. And that is one place you don't want to go. Stay away from the that, seals. There's a good safety tip. And on that note, I'm going to thank you. And we'll be back with another sea tale right after this. My next Sea Tales guest is Mr. Steve Lebo. Welcome aboard, sir. Hi, Mark. Glad to meet you. Uh, could you give me a brief history of your boating uh, history? Well, over the years, I've been in boating, Mark, around 42. Mm -hmm. And over that period of time, I've had eight boats, six of which were power, and two sailboats. I presently have a 30-foot Hunter, which is a sailboat, and I come out of Pacific Corinthian Yacht Club here. Mm -hmm. um, We've, we've had uh, occasion to sail, uh, work aboard uh, the Mississippi barges, uh, Ohio River. Uh, we've had uh, worked on tonnage boats out of uh, Lake Erie and Chesapeake Bay before coming to California and been involved in boating out here for the last uh, 19 years. So that's quite an extensive history. I understand you have a sea tale for us, a safety story, sure true do. story with a safety message. I sure do. Did I get that out of you? <laughs> we'll give it a try. Mark, no matter how long you've been around boating, you find that uh, you, you, you can get into trouble. Uh, this ocean out here is really something not to toy with. Uh, no matter how much education you have, you still must always be cautious. Uh, and I guess I'm a little bit of a safety nut. 
we were on our way, we had been over in Alberts uh, at Santa Cruz Island, and it had been a beautiful uh, three days there, but we had to leave. And we came around the island, uh, long past Yellow Banks and into, into smugglers. And at that point in time, uh, we got hit by a, a downdraft off the mountain, if you will, and took a knockdown right off the, right off the coast. When we righted, we found we For our new boating friends that are just new to boating, could you explain a knockdown for them? Well, a knockdown is when you're, you get a tremendous gust of wind, which will, can average 50, 60 knots, and it actually tips the sailboat completely over. Because of the pressure on the sail. On the sail, mm -hmm. and you actually go into the water, and you, you, your boat can actually fill with water. However, the boat I have now is a fairly safe boat, so it righted itself completely. So it just came right back right up. Right back mm -hmm. up, but of course we were drenched. Mm -hmm. um, after that happened, we were caught in this very strong wind. I managed to get a reef into the main and drop the jib, and we were off and running in eight to 10 foot seas in no time at all from a perfectly calm, flat area. Um, about. 40 minutes on that run, the jib halyard, uh, the, the, the halyard uh, parted, and I lost my main. Uh, meanwhile, I had gone below and dragged out the storm jib, and we were, I had to go forward on a deck that was bouncing seven feet in the air and seven feet down, and put that jib on there. And, Again, and, for and, and, new people and friends in boating, a storm jib is just a small sail that goes up in the front of the boat. That's and heavy correct. seas and stuff that'll hold up. That's correct. That. It's a small, it's a small jib. So uh, we were able to get that up, but the uh, the wind was blowing so hard, uh, we were running with it now, and it was showing up on the wind meter at 47 knots, blowing. Uh, that was at the low point, and it was gusting up over 50 knots. Uh, we were running, in fact, we made the run back here, and if I had missed the entrance coming in, we would have had to go on to Marina Del Rey. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> There'd be no way to turn around. And, what, what would normally yeah. be a four-hour run, we made in two and a half hours, mm -hmm. so you can see we were moving along pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, damage done to the boat was minor. Uh, the sails were extensive. The main sail I had to have redone, and since then have replaced uh, a couple of uh, foresails for the boat. But I think, I think the thing here is that you should always carry the proper sails with you. Be ready for these emergencies. And secondly, I think, too, that, that, that this ocean out here is, on a day like today, which is really beautiful, you know, it's nice, it's wonderful, it's a lot of fun. But nothing pays off like education and being able to know, you know, what to do in this kind of a situation. Because your life and other people's are in danger. And they depend on how, how much you know, how prepared you are, and if you indeed have the right equipment on board. That's correct, Mark. Now, I've been involved with the United States Power Squadrons for over 28 years, and I teach in those, co those courses. And I think anyone that is out on the water should at least alleviate themselves of either a good uh, USPS course or the Coast Guard Auxiliary has courses as well. And I think further, joining a, a club such as Pacific Corinthian Yacht Club is a help because we all boat together usually. We go out in a group, uh, we watch out for one another, and when somebody else gets in trouble, we try to help them out as well. So also on your races and what have you, you actually learn how to push your boat to the maximum. And oh, sometimes you push a little over and something breaks or goes wrong, but there are those people there and hopefully you've you know, done your homework sure. to where you're going to survive that. Better than if you're out there caught in bad seas and you have to do it on your own. That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing I might tell you about that happened to me one time, we were out and had rented a boat, believe it or not, out of Ventura. And the gentleman, we ran across right at the end of our sail, uh, a gentleman in a very large boat, it was a 45 foot, uh, a uh, 45-foot uh, Chris Craft commander mm -hmm. approached us. I see we do have about one minute left, so. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, very quickly, he had run out of fuel. Now, mm -hmm. imagine a 45-foot boat asking a small sailboat to tow him into, in, first of all, it, did you have gasoline? Well, you know, that would be just enough to start the engines. Mm -hmm. And secondly, would you please give us a tow type of thing? 
you should always go out and be prepared. Be prepared for those contingencies. Otherwise, you can get into a lot of trouble. I guess that's my main message. Also, I, I did hear from, a, from an attorney that uh, once you attach a line to that man's boat, the little sailboat actually is liable as for that. And uh, so you really want to be cautious on what you're doing and view the situation, what have you. Now, on that note, I'm going to have to say thank you, sir. And we'll be back with another Sea Tales right after this. My next guest uh, for Sea Tales is Mr. Floyd Woodcock. Is that right, sir? That's right, well, Mark. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your past experience in boating, sir? Well, basically, I've been, in, been involved in boating since I was a youngster. But uh, as a boat owner, I've been uh, a boat owner for the past 18 years. And I've owned four boats, uh, three power boats and one sailboat plus a few miscellaneous things like dinghies and whatnot. So uh, I've had some experience at boating. I hope will be appropriate for your yeah. purpose. I'm sure, I'm sure you do have a sea tale for us, a true story with a safety message. Could I you do. tell our viewers one? I sure do. Um, we do a lot of cruising with the club. And it's, that's a, a, in our club cruises, we frequently have. That's tenor. being Pacific Corinthian Yacht Club that's where correct. we're filming today. Uh, we have 10 or 15 boats or sometimes more who will go on a weekend cruise or and then each summer we have a uh, two-week cruise um, it was on one of these two-week cruises that my uh, my sea tail uh, occurred we uh, were in a boat that was it was it's the boat i have now which is a 41 foot rough water power boat um, and it was new to me at the time i was i had it was my first year with the boat and I was getting used to things. And uh, one of the characteristics of this particular boat is that it's a diesel powered boat. And it has two fuel tanks. Um, and I had been cruising for the best part of two weeks and, and had what I thought was plenty of fuel on board because it's a very economical boat. And I was on my way from Catalina to uh, Oxnard. And I had gotten just about halfway, and uh, all of a sudden my engine acted funny and then stopped. And I can tell you, it's a, it's a uh, uh, depressing feeling when you're about 16 miles from Catalina and 20 miles from land uh, to have your engine stop. And at the time, I thought you know, I had no idea what this was. I thought perhaps I had dirty fuel or something like that. So I uh, I radioed to my uh, to my uh, fellow boaters that I was stopped in the water and was checking out a fuel filter. Uh, kind of a little courtesy message. Yeah, so they know why I was dead in the water and that, uh, and they would keep track of my uh, progress after that, mm -hmm. which is one of the benefits of cross cruising in groups. Uh, so I uh, crawled into my engine room and, uh, and proceeded to pull out the fuel filter and yes, it, would, it turned out it was very dirty, so I thought that was, that was the problem, so mm -hmm. I changed the fuel filter and uh, started the thing up, radioed to my buddies and said, um, everybody's going great, I'm underway again. Well, that was good. It went about 15 minutes and stopped again. Uh, and this time I was a little more concerned. So I, uh, again, radioed my friends and said, I, I got something a little more serious. Would somebody mind hanging around? Because uh, they, by this time, had gone off and left me. And uh, one of our friends came back and, and stood by whilst I, uh, crawled in my engine room some more, and, after, and finally, after some period of time, we decided the best thing to do was to tow the boat to Marina del Rey, which was the nearest place that I could uh, get some service, and uh, which I would say it was about 20 miles from there. So uh, he took me under tow very kindly while I continued to work on my engine. Well, a few miles out of Marina del Rey, to, uh, to make a long story short, uh, I, I sorted about three, out. Three minutes left. I so. sorted out. Uh, <laughs> What, what the problem was, and the problem was this, with two fuel tanks, uh, I'm uh, feeding fuel from both tanks at the same time. 
the diesel engine, however, doesn't run very well on air. So the, the, as soon as one of the tanks got low enough that it sucked a little bit of air, it stopped the engine. And it turned out that I had uh, unbalanced my fuel tanks you know, over the course of this two-week cruise. And one tank had a good deal less fuel than the other, and it wasn't recognizable to me until the engine stopped. And uh, after a good deal of, uh, of sweating in the engine room, I finally figured out what was wrong. And uh, Started the engine, put into Marine Del Rey on my own power, so I felt a little better about that. But the more, there's a couple of things about the story that are important uh, for uh, boaters. Uh, first of all, be sure you have enough fuel, and be sure you know how your how your boat consumes fuel, as to how it draws fuel from the tanks, uh, and and even more importantly, make sure you know where you are, because when your boat breaks down, it's very important to know where you are, and. Uh, in this case, we changed course and headed for Marina del Rey, and, uh, uh, which was, uh, we were out of sight of land at the, at the time and, and uh, required uh, some precision in knowing exactly where we were at the, at the point where we were starting to tow. Uh, well, I see but, we have about a minute and a half, two minutes left. So it goes back to what a lot of people say is when you get your boat or if you get a new boat, to really become familiar with every absolutely. inch of that absolutely. boat. Absolutely. It's and important. Every that, crack. It's mm -hmm. very important that you understand how all the systems work, mm -hmm. uh, how the engine operates, uh, where all the filters are, where all the valves are, and what those valves do. Uh, I, I know on our power boat, I uh, went out and it ran fine for quite a while. Then all of a sudden it quit. You know, and it was just the tiniest filter in the carburetor. Right. But it's a matter of knowing what it is. Yes. And at that time, I didn't have spares, so I cleaned it out. I actually dried it out and tapped it out and it worked mm. fine you know and got me back uh because it was kind of a demo ride thing where yes. we hadn't been able to go through the whole boat and yes. put everything in the world on it that we'd like to have but uh to know your boat know every inch of it all the equipment is is so important that i don't think i could stress it enough to the new boater out there yes you know, and buy carry spares and carry spares of a whole yeah. variety of things for i think one of the best ways to take care of this is talk to other boaters Go out down on the docks and talk to as many people that are into boating Absolutely. as you can finally possibly find, as well as the educational courses. Absolutely. And the Yacht Club, of course, offers that, you know, a lot of experienced people with a lot of knowledge and what yeah, there's always With the Yacht Club, there's always somebody to help you out when you get in, into some mischief. It's the kind I described. <laughs> but the best thing is preventative maintenance and, of course, you yes. know, having the people to talk to is, is quite an asset. Absolutely. On that note, I appreciate you being here, sir. Oh, thank you, Mark. Enjoy. And I appreciate you being here. This has been Captain's Log, Sea Tales, true stories that could save your property and perhaps your life or that of a loved one. Awesome.